Hello, hi, I'm Wendy Liebman and welcome to Conversations with We. Um, I'm delighted to have here my partner in crime today, Heather Hughes. Hey Heather, how are you? Hi Wendy, I'm good, thank you. Good, here we are, sort of both suspended in animation in our homes. Um, we are. Yeah, welcome, welcome to you all and from Heather and I, um, or is it Heather and me, uh, but from us, we hope you're all well. We hope your families are well, that work is manageable. So, that you are. Um, very good to have you here with us. We're going to talk today about leadership in crisis or managing leadership in crisis or how do we lead in crisis, that sort of whole story of the world we're now living in and how do we engage with that in ways that um, help us all grow and be stronger when we come out the other end. So let me do a little bit of an introduction. Uh, so Heather's not sitting there totally mute, not mute, but really, okay. just tell you how this is going to work today. Um, we, as you know, and I'll ask Heather to talk a little bit about how it got started, but we as an organization that began several years ago to help in the development, building a community to help women and development in healthcare and the wellness industry. So if ever there's been a a more critical time for that. This is it. So we're happy to have this conversation today and talk about it. This is the third in the series we have had of our uh, chats with leaders in the industry. And so I'm really thrilled to have Heather by, she probably needs no introduction, but let me just give you the full lengthy title. She is the group vice president and DMM of, or GMM, wait a minute, GMM, sorry, I'm gonna get it right. I have, I have another computer here because I have no printer. So I have <laughs> computers, I'm juggling notes and everything. Um, and GMM of seasonal general merchandise and photo for the Walgreens company. And she has quite an interesting and illustrious career at the company, which she'll tell you about in a minute. So the way this is going to work is that uh, Heather and I will have a chat for about 30 minutes and uh, about one o'clock, we will then take questions from you in the audience. Uh, there is a Q&A box, you'll find it somewhere depending on how you're looking at us. So please feel free to type in any questions you have and then we'll try to get to as many of them as we can at the end. Uh, we will be recording this, it will be available through our website and our LinkedIn um, site so that if you want to share it with friends, family and the rest of your team, uh, that would be wonderful. We'd, we'd love to love you to do that, which would be terrific. So um, the only other things I say to you is we're all at home, right? So there <laughs> are kids, dogs, partners, phones, you know, it'll be like your life, something will go on. So do not panic, it'll be fine. Um, so if you hear any of that going on, you know, welcome to our lives as we welcome you to you know, we know you where you're sitting now, as she says, trying to juggle all that. The only other qualification is Heather and I are our own tech people today. <laughs> um, and I always hate it when women come up and say, oh, well, I'm not very good at tech. So we're not going to say that. Uh, we're going to tell you we've got plan A and plan B. Plan A is it works. And here we are. Plan B is if there are any issues, I'm in the woods. So, you know, Wi-Fi is a little spotty. But if we have any issues, don't panic, we'll try and fix it. If we can't, we'll just leave you to, you know, go off into the sunset today and we will send you a recorded copy for your records. So no panics on that, we're all incredibly capable and ready to go. So enough of me blabbing. Heather, before we talk about you and life and leadership, um, can you just set up, since you were a founding member of uh, WE, uh, could you just tell us a little bit about WE and how it got started? Yeah, Wendy. So, um, you know, I was fortunate enough. I was at an event and um, met, I've met a number of female leaders and there was about 20 of us that um, decided to get together and um, just kind of have a conversation. And we were all within the health and wellness space in some way or another, whether it's supplier, retailer. Um, and we just met for two hours and our agenda was really simple. It was just to connect with each other and share experiences. So all just female leaders and wanting to have connections. And, 
you know, the, the topics were pretty simple. How do you, how do, you do work life balance? Um, how do you manage uncomfortable moments and sharing some funny stories around that? Some, everything that you would expect. Um, and the energy was really positive and we thought, you know, we should have more of this and we should invite more people in and, um, you know, kind of walked away saying, let's, let's share a mission to just empower more women and advance the next generation so that they're empowered as well and, and develop a community. And so that's kind of what we've done with we, and it's a community that we've been able to share, um, the same types of conversations at industry events, whether it be through panels or receptions or various activities. Um, which have been wonderful. And, and I think, you know, those who have gone and attended have really enjoyed it, but we also realized it doesn't reach everyone. So that's actually what brought on conversations with we was to put together an opportunity to continue those types of conversations we were having in those events, but make it available to everyone. Cause that's what a community is, is everybody can do it. So that that's how it all, all evolved and, um, and why we're here today. Yeah. No, that's great. And I, and I do remember it struck me um, when we did the first panel at the NACDS Total Store Expo a couple of years ago. Uh, that was the first time I really sort of got to know you, except beyond the, around the board table at, at WE. And, and something that stands out to this day is that you brought your daughter Madison, who I think is maybe watching. Hey, Madison. Not yeah. <laughs> in the other room, right? In the Where other room, she's not with me. <laughs> the other room, um, not under the desk. Um, but you brought your daughter Madison, I think it was her birthday. It um, was. Why was that important for you and for her? You know, um, I view it as a mom and as a leader in organization. I, I Part of my job as a mom and as a female is to, to expose her to, to opportunities where she can see women being strong women communicating in large forums and showing confidence and one of those women being her mom and so it was important for me to show her even though she told me she didn't understand some of what we talked about which makes sense right. um she did get the fact that on a stage a lot of people there and women were very confident and powerful and people wanted to hear about it and th that was definitely a takeaway and, and important for me to show her at a young age yeah, yeah. Sometimes we take it for granted, right? Because here we are. And I find in our, you know, consulting practice, and we're dealing with leaders in retail and shopper insights and things like that. And you sometimes forget where you've come from. Yeah. Get there. So that really touched me a lot, because I had a mum like you who wanted to expose me to things. And, and I, I think about that a lot and it says a lot about you. So aside from all of that. So speaking of which, Tell us a little bit about you and how you got to where you did um, at the Walgreens company and in life. And that'll sort of sow the seeds for the conversation about leadership. Yeah. Um, so I'll kind of, I'll start with the life aspect and then where that took me to Walgreens. But, um, you know, as younger in my age, uh, when I was looking at what kind of schools I wanted to do and what did I want to pursue, I always knew I wanted to help people and get into some sort of healthcare. I was fortunate that uh, my mom went to nursing school when I was a kid and I, and I actually attended college classes with her because I enjoyed the topics. Um, and, you know, through all of that, it led me to pharmacy and um, enjoyed phone would ring sorry guys hopefully oh. somebody will answer it <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so it led me to um the path of pharmacy and uh pursuing that degree and you know eventually there as i graduated pharmacy school and practiced pharmacy for walgreens um found my path up into our support office and that led me to where i am now which is in merchandising and um, in business and although still in part of a healthcare company i'd say I'm, I'm managing more of the emotional health than call it the treatment and wellness and those type of typical things that i was doing historically so that that actually is interesting because i think about emotional health and i think about the times we now live in what do you know now, or what are you thinking about now that you didn't in January or December or November? I mean, how has your life <laughs> changed? You know, well, I, I'm gonna interrupt myself, which I have a terrible habit of doing. You know, we all, often for the audience, one of the things that often comes up in the we conversations is work-life balance. 
and I just laugh now, right? <laughs> yeah. why, why were we even worrying about that in November? And here yeah. we are, right, in, in, uh, in May. So what's your life like now? What is your day like when you think about your teams, your family, your leadership style? What do you know now? That you yeah, do? you know, I, I've always had a perspective, um, work-life balance, it's tough, right? It, everybody fights this balance constantly. And I've always kind of viewed it as it's work, work life integration. So there are times I need to leave work for life. And there are times I need to leave uh, my personal life to be able to accomplish what I need to for work. And, and I'm okay with that as long as I, I keep it where it's not, you know, unbalanced in that way. And I find I'm doing that at home too. So I, uh, you know, as we went virtual, I, uh, my, one of my first calls, and there was many, many people on this call, you know, all the way up from an executive perspective. And, uh, you know, my team was on there and I happened to go off mute to comment on something. And that was the exact moment that my five-year-old thought it would be perfect to attack me like a dinosaur. And he did, and it was loud and everybody on the phone heard uh, or on the call heard. And uh, you know, it gave, it gave a moment of a reality, right? Mm -hmm. This is what everybody's dealing with. And my five-year-old's not going to preschool. Our nanny wasn't coming into the house and I'm having to occupy my dinosaur Dylan at the same time that uh, you know, I'm trying to manage a call. And, um, you know, and I think that's, that's the struggle that everybody has and everybody does their best to kind of work around that and um it i actually think it allows people to expose what's really been going on because people have been trying to almost hide that they have this life going on in the background and now it's front and center and i don't think it's a bad thing i actually think it's i welcome it i think it's mm -hmm. i think it's great that it's out out in front it's interesting you say that because in everybody i've spoken to um, over these last two months two and a half months that we've been home that's exactly the comment people come to, that now we see much more of our personal lives and how it fits and who we are. And it's a much more open and honest conversation about the work. We're still getting the work done. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're pushing through it. Um, we're doing some really innovative things because we have to, but we're not one dimensional. And exactly. I found that's really, that's really interesting. Um, so, for, and even for the audience today, we were thinking we needed one of those fake backdrops that said we, <laughs> and Andrew yeah. Fallon, our great leader, who's there somewhere, she's the chairperson of the board. Um, she said, no, no, people want to see. So it's like, okay, we better clean up our rooms, right? Or whatever <laughs> that was. But anyway, that's In the fine. basement. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, I'm all open space, so you can see anything <laughs> going on here. So that's a worry. Tell me a bit about how your experience at Walgreens has helped you in this moment in time in terms of leadership. How, what, have, what is it you've learned along the way and how has that helped you now and or what have you had to learn differently? I know it's a big long question. Yeah, um, so what I'd start with, one thing at Walgreens is um, that I've learned along the way and built along the way is just relationships. I have built so many relationships and um, rapport with everyone that I've ever worked with. And I love it. I, I, it's my favorite part is working with people and, um, and I love every relationship that I've ever built. And I'd say, you know, when you move to a virtual environment where you're not able to maybe have those casual hallway conversations anymore, or, um, you know, drive by someone's desk, it does make it make it tougher and um and i've had to adapt how how i kind of lead through that and um have those conversations still whether it's a simple text whether it's a im chat and uh and then hop on the call real quick um so i i've had to really adapt to some of that and it's not just me i think everybody you know is finding that that's a, certainly a challenge um but because I have those historical relationships, it certainly helps that I, I have a, a strong comfort in being able to reach out to to hit anyone and everyone that I've um, built those relationships along the way at Walgreens and um, and not hesitate to to ask you know how they might be managing something or if, if they can help with something and um, as we've had to be really agile within the company and adapt to the environment that we're in. So is that those relationships that you built? Um, was that a sort of a more formal process? I mean, was there a mentoring and a mentee thing going on there within the organization or is that just your nature to do that? What should we, what should we know from that and how's that served you? 
Yeah, um, so it wasn't a formal process. Um, the, there's, a, there's a bit of that that we have here at the company, but um, I, find, I find the formal processes sometimes aren't as productive as just doing it naturally and having those conversations and, um, and then saying, hey, you wanna grab lunch or, uh, or just when you see someone stopping for 10 minutes and catching up. And I, I find so much value in that. Um, Plus, I just I like knowing what's going on with everyone, and I just feel it's more genuine and it's it's true to who I am and how I want to be. So um, I tend not to steer toward those kind of set up programs versus just developing those relationships over time. Yeah. Um, so as you think about that and the way you're working with your team now, how are you um, how are you leading now differently than you might have pre? the COVID crisis? Yeah, um, so obviously we don't have, since we can't touch base in person, we're spending a lot of time, we use Teams, so we spend a lot of time on Teams. Um, and we use video a lot. I think we were uncomfortable at first. We didn't really turn the video on. Now, um, when we're in the smaller settings or when I'm running a team meeting, the video's on. And I, um, and I have tried to bring about the things that we were doing before, but bring them into the virtual setting. So for example, when we have new team members, imagine being a new team member, starting a new company, and entering through this virtual environment where you've never actually in person met anyone, not even the person that hired you. And mm -hmm. um, so we always uh, have these team meetings and our new team members get to put a slide together that has kind of fun pictures and, um, piece of information about themselves and you know turn your video on we want it we want to see you we want to hear you and get to know you and so I think everybody's adapting to those types of, of ways of working and kind of bringing it into the virtual environment mm -hmm. um, versus it obviously being in person but I have more of those types of touch bases now it, right it, you just have to because you don't have the hallway conversations anymore Right, right. Now you've you've got you've had an interesting background at Walgreens because you came from, as you said, pharmacy, and then now you're in merchandising. You were on health and wellness. You did the what are the wonderful angels that you did the vitamin angels, vitamin angels, and that program. Um, and now you're in general merchandise and seasonal, and as you work through all of those things. So how is that movement? I mean. How, how did you how did you make that change? Was that on you or did you raise your hand for it? How did that come about? And how what have you learned about yourself as you moved and shifted throughout the organization? And what should our younger, you know, sort of next gen audience think about there? Yeah. Um, so interesting question, because I would say younger in my career, as I did move around, I wasn't the one raising my hand and it wasn't because I didn't want to, I probably just didn't think about doing it or I wasn't courageous enough to raise my hand. However, I had a lot of um, relationships with other people that raised their hand for me. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's actually how I moved around. So um, when I was out in the field as a pharmacy manager, my um, pharmacy supervisor at the time, Tasha Polster, she, you know, we were talking about what's my, what's the next thing that I'm going to do. And the only path I knew really was, okay, you go and be a pharmacy supervisor. That's the path. And she said, no, no, we're going to find you a different path. I think you have opportunity to go up into the support center. And so she came back to me, you know, months later and said, I want you to go apply for this other role. And it was a, um, a role that doesn't exist anymore, but it was back when we had a pharmacist shortage. And it was a liaison between the field and um, pharmacy schools and our our, our uh, HR department to be able to help bring in talent, our pharmacy pharmacy talent into stores. And, um, and so when I was in that role, then I started meeting other folks and that's how I met folks within merchandising. And, um, and then there again, my now friend, Andrea uh, Calero, she raised her hand for me and said, I think you need to come over here and do this role. And it was essentially an associate category manager with an educational component um, as a, it was called a disease state manager. And, uh, and so I said, okay, that sounds interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And, uh, but then from there I started raising my hand, um, mm -hmm. and I started saying, okay, I think I, I want to do this. I, I want to be a category manager. Can I have that role? And, um, so it, it, it's interesting because younger in my career and, you know, I look back on it, reflect on it. I, I should have been raising my hand and I wasn't necessarily doing it, but I certainly had advocates out there to help me. So how do you encourage people in your team 
to do, or people that you know within the organization to do that now, to raise their hand now rather than depend on others? Yeah, I think, um, you know, awareness of, of what's happening in the environment around you and opportunities that present themselves and, and saying, hey, I, I really think that's interesting and, um, and talking directly with your manager and saying, I'd like to get involved with that too. And um, there's many ways to do that, right? It could be getting involved with a project that allows you to learn um, more within the company, or it may be that there's a new role that very much interests you and, and not fearing raising your hand to say, I think this could be an uh, interesting opportunity for me. And, um, and I would encourage folks to do that. I think, you know, what I didn't realize then that I realize now is leaders don't necessarily know what you want to do. So if you don't tell them, there's no way that they can help guide you um, without those, those camp conversations. Now, did you ever raise your, when you started to raise your hand, did you ever raise your hand and somebody said, mm -mm, sorry? Um, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know that it was mm -mm, sorry, but okay, here are the things that you need to work on or to continue to work on. Yeah. And then I think that role could be right for you. Um, and there's definitely roles that I um, interviewed for and didn't get along the way. And um, and you know, and definitely took the feedback as to okay, why did I get not get that role, and um, and how do I then improve on that? So, yeah, I'd say yes. Um, but uh, the the great thing is the feedback is what's most important to continue to develop. Yeah. So here we are in uncharted waters, right? This is a time that I mean, I always I say to people, this actually isn't our first crisis. Um, you know, we could go back to two thousand and eight and the stock market crash, which seemed to happen overnight and change things around. We have, for some of us, 2001, the September 11 events. So, so even for, you've been at Walgreens, what, 20 years or thereabouts? Yeah. Right? Um, so in that lifetime, you've had crises at different, at, you know, different levels of crises. Um, but how has your job changed in the last two or three months? Well, I'd say the biggest thing is uh, in one word, if I put it in one word, it's agility. Um, so I think, you know, before the crisis, um, everyone was talking about agility is important. That's how companies are going to succeed. And um, we need leaders to be agile and, and, and certainly believed in that. But it, it turned into, no, 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 we need you to be agile right now in this moment and about as agile as you can be. So. Um, you know, whether it be, hey, we were doing, we we're going down this other path and now we need to completely change our path and have, you know, new short term, long term objectives and, and strategies to, to drive toward that path. So um, I, I think it's, it's great to, to know that you had that muscle, you know, in you, but then now really having to flex it and say, okay, uh, how agile can we be in order to adapt to this crisis and adapt to how customers are changing? Yeah. Um, is that the biggest surprise you've had about yourself throughout this or what is the biggest surprise? Um, the biggest surprise. Uh, I wouldn't, I don't know that it was, it's agility, but maybe it's, um, my, I think the way that the teams have really been agile. So it's probably less about me and more about how the teams really have it in them. Right. Like the, my team is amazing. They, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say, hey, we need to do this and we need to do it now. And um, and oh, by the way, at the same time that you're doing all these other things. So I'm really sorry about that. But this is what we need to do. And somehow they're getting it done. And I, I've been really impressed because I've, I've, you know, like sending them in a completely different direction while maintaining the direction that we're in. And they've been able to adapt. So I think that's really, really what surprised me. And not because I didn't think that they were capable of it. I just never had to test the team to that degree to find out that, wow, it's pretty amazing how strong they are and how agile they really are. Yeah, that ability to cope. I mean, I'm, I, you know, from a personal point of view, the sort of what I'm going to call the shop of view, which of course is the work we do. There's a, we just finished some of our How America Shops research, and there was one data point. There's always one that sort of jumps up. Um, that 52% of the population said they were proud of how they were managing in this crisis. And this was, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and that to itself, that by itself said to me so much about us as people, as 
people in the workplace. I mean, when so many people are losing their jobs and so many people are ill and sadly dying, and so and our lives are being out of kilter. So with that sort of from a that's very shopper centric, but but we are the shoppers, right? So yeah. that that what you just said there, I think, is really extraordinary. When you think, and you've talked about hiring a little bit now, so when you think about hiring, if you were hiring somebody today, tomorrow, as you no doubt will be, what are you looking for now that may be different to what you might have six months ago? So, I, I, you know, it does get back to this ability to be flexible, mm -hmm. um, agile. So you may be hiring into a role that is defined a particular way today, but the customer may, may redefine that role to be something different six months from now or three months from now, mm -hmm. just based on how quickly everything's changing. I think that's probably one of, one of the big things that I would be looking for outside of kind of the normal parameters because um, I wouldn't want anybody to come into a job thinking, well, it's absolutely this. And um, knowing that the way the customer is changing so quickly right now that we, we also are going to have to change too. Yeah, that's very interesting. And, and that talks to, to the question for you about how do you see healthcare changing in the next six months, 12 months? I mean, do you have a view of that? Um, you know, I, I certainly not uh, our pharmacy team, but I, you know, I, I think at a very high level, when you think about healthcare, just um, people are going to think different about prevention. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's going to ingrain in them that they're thinking about everything they touch, um, everything they come in contact with, who they come in contact with. Um, and, and it's, it's going to change the dynamics of how they clean their house or how they, um, keep their hands clean and kind of basic hygiene is going to go into a bit of overdrive. Um, and how, you know, how does that sustain over time? I'm not sure. I think that that's what's going to be interesting. And then what are the ramifications to healthcare when, when those types of changes happen? Mm -hmm. And then I think you couple that with, um, you know, as people have been in these lockdowns and maybe not out and as active as typical, you know, there might be some weight gain. And so people may be thinking about, okay, now it's time to become more active and because I need better health anyways for um, the circumstances that we're in. And so I think all of these things are going to come into play into um, customers and into the healthcare industry as, uh, as it continues to evolve in this setting. And then the, the real interesting piece is over time as, the, as there is a vaccination, how, what stays and what changes. And I think that that's where, um, it, you know, we won't be able to make as much of a prediction just yet, but, um, but over time it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, it is interesting to think about how technology not only has informed and changed our work life, um, but the way technology has transformed not only how we buy, because obviously that was part of it, but how we get our medical care. I'm, I'm intrigued when I get my push from Walgreens that says, you know, if you want sort of the doc in a box, the pharmacist in a box, we're here for you, all of those things. Old world delivery, you know, we can deliver things. So old world, new world through technology. Um, how do you see that informing both the work you do um, in your areas of merchandising and the expectations you have of your team and what sort of talent they need in that in that way. Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll speak to in general in merchandising because the seasonal and gen merch, there's some plays, not as much as there will be, I think, in the healthcare areas. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as you think about telehealth and what that might look like and more over-the-counter recommendations um, or even usage of pharmacists um, even more so because they are accessible. Um, I think all of those come into play. Um, when I think about it as it relates back to the categories that my teams manage, um, you know, it's, I think new categories are going to develop over time, mm -hmm. right? So when we think about gen merch today, I think there's going to be new gen merch categories mm -hmm. that are going to answer and solve for, for solutions, whether it's within the tech space or the support against the tech space. Mm -hmm. Um, as it's related to healthcare and other types of, of concepts um, that support, you know, kind of the outcomes of, of where we're headed. Yeah, I think about, I was thinking about general merchandise the other day and I was thinking about, you know, in the, in, in the drugstores in the day and to some degree today, you know, you could find a folding ch beach chair, right? At the, yeah. The, and now I see people when they're having their meet, you know, they're, they're having friends come by kind of drive-bys 
and people have got those folding chairs. And I was thinking, oh, that's kind of a health and wellness thing. You know, we need yeah. to have a folding chair so we can sit outside and wave to our family as they drive by and sing happy birthday or something. Um, so you're right. Everything really has a different kind of lens um, yes. from a merchandising standpoint or a health standpoint as we move forward, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, it, and it, I find it really fascinating, right? Because we were thinking about it with a different lens coming into the business pre-COVID. And then now that we're in COVID, you're thinking about, wow, this is a completely different usage that would have never been defined that way, um, you know, six months ago. Yeah. And, and so the role, sort of here's the big question, the role for women in this world, this new world, um, in, in management, I, w I look around the world and I see some of these extraordinary female leaders who are getting lots of credit for the way they've managed this crisis versus some of the male leaders, no politics intended. <laughs> um, but as I think about that, you know, our determination as we, as, a, as this community, to enhance the role of, of women and female talent in health and wellness. Does this help us at all? Does this help us, you know, um, this crisis, is, is there something there that we can take advantage of as women? Yeah, you know, um, I think if, if women want to, it can. I mean, there's a certain amount of compassion that comes in here as, as you, and empathy, right? Mm -hmm. As you think about uh, whether it's um, folks that have lost jobs, whether it's um, you know team members who are now adapting to this new integrated solution where their children are front and center with them at work, um, I, I think I think it's something that moms and females cope with on a regular basis and maybe have some better understanding to. And um, you know, I even find it interesting watching my husband kind of adapt to the environment too. And I, uh, you know, a month or two ago, he was closed door, no one could come into the bedroom when he was on a call. Now, I came in the other day and I closed it. He's like, oh no, it's okay. If they see in the background, it's okay. You know, just, I, I actually think, uh, you know, whereas I was sitting out in the open almost the entire time so that I could help the kids. Um, I think, I think things can be taught to others, whether it's, um, you know, just having this open environment and um, under being understanding and compassionate and, and empathetic. And I think women have an opportunity to, to really rise to the challenge. And not that men don't have that, they absolutely do. They're, men are wonderful and many of them have it. Um, but it's certainly something that I think women, um, it's a strength of many women. Yeah. So if you think about, for, for those of you listening, um, watching, we, we have in addition to our um, board and the community expansion, we have a real focus on, we have a next gen board, next generation board, um, just so you know. But so for, as you think about the next generation, um, you're my next generation and your next generation, <laughs> um, are there two or three things that you would say to them now at this moment in time about how they should move forward? and think about their future and development in this health and wellness place and state of things? Yeah, I mean, I'd say first off, don't apologize for the situation you're in. Mm -hmm. It's okay, you know, you may not have daycare and your children are working with you and that is okay. And you may have to say, I'm sorry, I can't do, I can't be um, available at that time because I need to take care of my family. And I, I think all of that's okay and I think, um, being open and honest is about that um, with your leadership. I think this is a time where understanding comes in and quite frankly, exposure to that is so important because I think it's going to build the path for the future on it too. Um, and, you know, I also think um, be strong, be confident. We can get through this. We can get through all of this. And, um, and I think showing that strength and showing that confidence is going to help you stand out and, um, and continue to show that you have the strength to lead through this environment, whatever that may look like for the situation that everybody's in. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great way to sort of think about this and um, settle on something very positive and optimistic and uplifting. So I thank you for that. Uh, we're uh, into our, whatever, 40th minute or something, not quite, whatever it is. We've got about <laughs> 10 minutes now for questions. I'm looking at uh, a few of them here. 
Um, the first one said there was no volume, so I hope whoever whoever got onto that uh -oh. sorted that out because nobody else said it. So maybe okay. Beth, you figured out your volume situation. Hopefully. Um, so, oh, here's a question: How many members are in We? I don't know that I know the answer to that. I don't think I know the answer either. Okay, we're going to send you an answer to that. There are lots and we need more. So please go to the website. It's a weird website. Let me just, I had to write it down. It was on that first slide. It's www, the number four, we, we, four we dot org. So go on and engage with us and go onto our LinkedIn page and all of those things. Um, this, here's another question. Uh, how do you see the supplier and retailer relationship evolving in a post COVID world and what will be best in class partnering look like for you and your businesses? So, um, you know, supply and demand has greatly changed. Uh, what our customers are demanding today is different than what they demanded six months ago. And I think the suppliers that are able to adapt to this new demand and, um, and help the retailer adapt to the new demand and deliver to the customer and make sure that they have what they need are going to be the ones that are, are most successful um, and the way that the partnerships form are, are really about that relationship and making sure that we get what the customer needs and get that in front of the customer. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when you think about best in class partnership on that, um, it's, a, it's about having the discussions um, about this evolving time because the reality is none of us know what tomorrow is going to look like what one week from now is going to look like what three weeks from now let alone what the fall is going to look like or the winter is going to look like so sharing information and, and intelligence that everyone has um, and what we're all learning so that we can bring it all together to make our best educated hypotheses on what it might look like so we can prepare and make sure that we're ready for what may face us make sure our customers can get what they need, I think is the ultimate view of what best in class partnership will look like. Okay. Um, and so coming out of that question, you know, are there any positive is another question, any positive behaviors or habits that you're going to maintain coming out of this? And are, there are some you're going to say, like yeah. running and getting your hair colored, let's not do it at home, whatever that is. <laughs> Sorry, been so vain, but you know, aside from that. Yeah, um, you know, I'd say one of the big ones is life slowed down. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about you, Wendy, but my life was really, really, really busy um, prior to this. And I'm not saying it's not busy, but the moments that I've had to cherish with my family have been wonderful. And, and not to say that I didn't have it before, it's just they were all on a softball field or, mm -hmm. Um, at a basketball court or we were always on the run um, and so I, I have a new appreciation for take the moments to slow down and make sure we have those time together and I think I'm gonna prioritize that and make sure that that retains itself because I think it you know I've seen new bonds form between um, my kids and I want to make sure that those stay intact um, you, you know and that's kind of on the personal note and then on the on the work side I think you know, I think our ability to adapt to this environment and use virtual and and be and be successful in doing that mm -hmm. needs to stay and um, and being able to then allow team members to adapt and be flexible as they need to. I think all of that I, I want it to be takeaways for my team as as we continue to to work um, in this environment and then post the environment. Yeah, you said something earlier in the piece about, so this is my question, earlier in the piece about relationships and you, I know this about you and you said it, that this notion about building relationships has been really important. Um, have you found that easier, harder, different in a virtual, in a virtual setting like this? It, it is harder. It is harder. I mean, the, the moments where, as I mentioned, right, like you can't stop by someone's desk and you can't, you don't just bump into people in the hallway that you hadn't seen for a few weeks or a month. Mm. Um, so it is harder. I think there's going to need to be more effort to, to make it happen. You know, I, I reach out now and say, hey, do you want to get together on a Zoom mm -hmm. virtual happy hour and, um, and those types of things. So uh, I, I think 
I also am leveraging social media and I think that that's helpful too. And you can communicate that way. So th there's other tools out there to use um, and it's learning how to use them and, um, and try to accomplish the same types of things so that those relationships can t continue to, to form. And how does that, how do you, there was a, a little question here before about that, that vendor partnership then. So how does it, how has it helped or changed because of this virtual world now, the, as opposed to the people standing in the Walgreens lobby waiting for a meeting yeah. or going to one of the industry events that we love? Um, how are you, how is that working? Yeah, um, it's different. So uh, if you know, we can do simple things. Product samples are really hard to exchange. Um, but you know, when it comes to just general thinking of um, having that in-person meeting versus having your virtual meeting, you know, you still accomplish it. Like I still see your face. I mean, you know, I'm okay that I can't be in the same room, but we can still at least see one another. And I find that we're able to adapt in that way and and have that work for us mm -hmm. um i'd also say that it does allow for more flexibility because there are there are times when you know a meeting goes long or um or a new meeting just shows up on your calendar that you had not anticipated and it's on top of that poor vendor that's waiting in the in, in the room to to meet with you and you know and and then you feel terrible when you're saying, okay, I need to kind of bump you. What's your flight time? All of that becomes more flexible now. So when that, that comes in, you can say, Hey, can we shift our meeting by 30 minutes? And, and usually we can adapt much easier in this um, type of environment. So, and plus you can see your suppliers more. So the suppliers that are, um, you know, not local, you can actually see them over video frequently and we probably should have been using the tool before uh but now that we are are doing it it's um it's making it easier and just another way to stay in touch yeah it is amazing right how sometimes the technology or the tools we have that we actually don't use to maximum advantage it takes something hopefully not something like this again but something like this to sort of force us to rethink the mm -hmm. tools we're using and get out of that very traditional mode um, so I'm going to ask a last question. Any recommendations for how next gen should think about upskilling their digital expertise, considering we're now living in this world? <laughs> um, well, I find children are very helpful. <laughs> so I'd start there, <laughs> not having them necessarily, but they can help you with your, with your technology needs. And, um, and I do think it's important to now think about, okay, am I, do I have a good, credible LinkedIn profile and do I have do I need to establish context maybe differently than I did before um, and you know just think about those social sites and how they might work for you um, so that you can have different interactions and I, I, I would just encourage that type of activity um, as as we're using that as kind of the replacements to events happening where you might otherwise network in a social setting and I think um, at least I, from my perspective, but in this environment, I've even been more, um, when, when people have reached out, you, you, I want to take more time with them. I want to make sure that I can help them even more. And it's not to say that I didn't give them time before, but um, I, I, even more so now when someone reaches out, I, I make it a priority. And I think for our next gen, don't, don't be afraid to reach out to to folks ahead of you and, and ask the questions and see if there's anything that you can do to make sure that you're keeping those relationships that you need um, in order to feel that um, you're continuing to advance your career. Yeah, well, so you ended where you began. It's about relationships, right? It is. <laughs> On so many levels. And, and uh, so I, I must say we are right at the stopping mark. Um, thank you, Heather, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. In some ways, I feel I've spent more time with you, you know, one-on-one -on -one here than we do when we're around a table or a big meeting or something. So thank you. Thank you for your time and generosity. Thank you for being one of the founding members of the WE community. And I do encourage everybody, we had a wonderful roll up today, to, um, to you know, go to our website, go to our LinkedIn page and engage. Tell us what more you need because we'll do it virtually. Andrea Fallon, as I said, who is our um, chairwoman, chairperson of the, the board and a very active, and we have a very active group of next gen and, and, uh, and more mature board members. Um, 
So we're always looking for great ideas and especially to keep our relationships going and build advice and guidance as we go through this. Uh, we'll be coming back to you with sort of more virtual occasions as we go. So I wish you, Heather, and everybody at the other end well. Um, we could all use a, it's odd to say a long weekend, right? <laughs> not, not going anywhere probably, but at least we won't be on 27,000 Zoom calls unless they exactly. have a cocktail in their hands. So, so to everybody out there, um, wish you well from both of us. And Heather, I will uh, see you soon, no doubt. Sounds great, Wendy. Thank you so much for your time. Cheers to everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.